Hello, this video will help you to recall some of the information that you would have received on your water safety training day and includes information about the Environment Agency's standard operating processes for when working around water. On arrival at the work site, the first thing to do is to make sure that all the paperwork is correct and that your risk assessment and method of working is in place. At the work site, you also want to make sure you know where you are. So that might be using your phone, might be using a map, could be using a personal locator beacon. But you certainly want to check that you know the location and that you've got that recorded somewhere. You want to check and make sure that your phone has got a signal and if you haven't, you know where you need to go to to get a signal. Whichever life jacket that you're using, it's important that you do your pre-wear inspection, which is something you can do at site. Um, and if you've uh, taken a life jacket from a pool source in the office, I would definitely do this before you leave the office as well to make sure that the life jacket you've got out on site with you is fit for use. It should only take a couple of minutes to do this, but you need to practice this with the particular life jacket that you're using and become confident in it. And we recommend a minimum of 20 times for you to really become comfortable um, using this as a skill. It's a professional skill that if you work around water, you need to master. And if you don't master it, then there's great temptation, particularly if you're only an occasional wearer in the Environment Agency, not to do your pre-use inspection of your life jacket because you don't need to record it anywhere, you're just expected to do it. There have been a number of near misses on training where people have brought their life jackets with them on the training course and when we've opened them up they've either got out of date or missing or fired components inside the life jackets or the gas bottles have worked loose and therefore wouldn't fire and there's certainly been incidents out on site where people have ended up in the water and the life jacket has come up and off their head and off to the side because they haven't adjusted it properly. So going through these steps is an important professional skill for you that you should do every time, whether it's your life jacket that nobody else has used for the last 15 years or whether or not it's one you've just picked out of uh, a cupboard in the office. Please do them. Okay, it's time to stop the video and to have a little practice. What we suggest you do is that you collect your life jackets and that you go through, as a group, your pre-use inspection on the life jackets. We have a private YouTube channel which supports our training with the Environment Agency and you can get access to this from the UK Water Lead or contact us direct. There are three videos on the YouTube site which supports specifically life jacket training one looks at the different types of life jacket available within the Environment Agency. The second takes you through the pre-use inspection in considerable detail. And then the third looks at how to fit and adjust the different types of life jackets. A good way to make sure that all your team members are still up to speed with their pre-use inspections on life jackets is to get them to bring these life jackets to a team meeting and perhaps at the end of the meeting to do a round the table pre-use inspection. This is also a good opportunity to do an inflation test on the life jacket which is the periodic inspection that should be done every three months and recorded on your Airsweb system. Once all the site arrival checks are done we've got our personal protective equipment checked and we've put that on Depending upon the site and what you're doing, you may or may not require a helmet. And what helmet you require depends upon the site and the hazards that are on the site. We're now ready to do our last minute or site risk assessment by approaching the work site from a position of safety and to see whether reality meets what we were expecting to find. When we get to site, we zone our work areas into three distinct zones. The hot zone is the water itself. 
The cold zone is far enough back from the edge of the watercourse that you can't fall in. And then the warm zone is the boundary along the bank. Typically that's going to be 3 metres wide or 10-12 feet, something like that. So I'm probably just about on the boundary between the cold and the warm zone here. When you conduct your last minute risk assessment on site, you need to have the appropriate PPE on and uh, the minimum requirement to assist you operating in those areas and provide some support if you need to climb out. What we can then do is do a visual inspection of our work area where we're expecting to enter the water um, and to identify any real hazards that are on the site. It's really important that you do a hazard assessment before you assess the risks. Hazards typically are anything on the work site or around the work site that can hurt you, can create risk for you. That might be things that are in the water, it might be the nature of the water, it might be the bank, it might be restrictions or difficulty of access and egress, or it could be other site users. When we're thinking about how we're going to work in and around the water environment, we want to follow a hierarchy of control. So if we can avoid working in the water, we should avoid working in the water. If we need to work close to the water, but are expecting to stay dry, in other words, we are bank working, then we should do everything we can to prevent an accidental slip into the water. If our work requires us to enter the water, we need to make sure that we've got a sufficient assessment of the risk and we've put in place appropriate control measures to reduce the hazard associated with working in the water to as low as reasonably practical. In conditions like this, on a warm sunny day with low flow in a small stream, your hazards are going to be minimal. However, there are still hazards present so it's really important that every time you go through this hazard identification and risk assessment process when you get to site and that you then compare that to the planning documents that you brought with you. By combining those two activities you can make decisions with your team on site about what are the appropriate safe systems of work and controls for you to be able to either progress with the work as planned modify the work if required or abandon the task and reschedule for another day when conditions are different or more resources are available. One of the particular hazards that you'll face when working around water are access and egress points and general bank conditions. Most people who drown in the UK are competent swimmers and drown at the time they enter the water course. And for a fair few of them, the reason they've entered the water course is because they've slipped, tripped or fallen off a bank. So paying attention to the bank areas is really important for the team leader on the site. Unfortunately, sometimes it's difficult to assess the bank condition from the top of the bank. You physically can't see what's going on uh, in front of you and below you, so some caution is required. Where possible, it's better to assess the condition of the bank from the opposing side of the river. You'll get much better view of what conditions are like. But if you need to approach a bank, particularly a bank where you can't see or you don't have confidence in terms of how strong it is, there's vegetation over it or it's potentially undercut or it's a weak natural bank, then caution is required. Getting down on your uh, hands and knees as you approach it is a good thing. Using a pole to make some kind of assessment is also useful. If you don't have confidence that the bank is stable, then we need to find another area to work from. And don't just think about the bank area where you want to enter and come out of the watercourse. Also think about access to bank areas downstream where a colleague might flow to if they get swept away in the river. The team on the bank will naturally move downstream to try and assist them and they could potentially be working or moving into an area like this which is full of potential hazards.
If possible, the ideal bank access would be a slow gravel beach such as we have here. Often these areas are found on the inside of bends as we have here. The water is set to the outside and therefore the inside is slower and shallower. And these make ideal access and egress points and they also make very good areas to rescue or assist a colleague from. Walk in or crawl in and out access is particularly important if you're going to be working with waders on. So we're looking for opportunities or sites like this either at our work site or just downstream of it. Pause the video at this point and discuss with your colleagues what you look for when considering safe bank access for working in the water. Bear in mind that if we were working here and it was higher flow than it is today, one of the things we need to consider is what would happen to a colleague if they got washed off their feet. And here, quite clearly, there's a likelihood that they will be carried below the bridge, through the bridge. So we need to make an assessment of what conditions are like on the other side of the bridge and indeed whether or not we can get access down there from the bank or ideally from both banks. So we've walked downstream past the bridge from the beach we wanted to use for access to make an assessment of what conditions are like down here. As you can see, the main river channel coming underneath the bridge is a deeper pool of water and then there's a shingle bank opposite and then this side channel has got what we refer to as a strainer in it. All right, this is just a collection of debris and indeed your whole task and reason for being here might be to remove stuff like this. So we need to make sure that if a worker gets swept into this area a, that there's no significant hazards that are going to give them a hard time or prevent them from exiting the water and B, a work colleague can make their way into this area to provide assistance with a pole or a throw line if required. And here, that's problematic. Once again, we are downstream of our original work site beneath the bridge and on a small island in the river and we can see that at high flows we've got scour so clearly water runs through this area here and there's a not insignificant debris pile built up here and this is classically hazards along the banks that you have to evaluate and contend with right what is downstream of me okay how difficult will it be for me to get out of the water on my own and how likely is it for a colleague who is moving down the bank to try and follow me and assist me is going to end up in an area like this where it's presenting lots of hazards for themselves. Trip hazards, entrapment hazards, impalement hazards, not just to your body but to your face and your eyes. So thinking about when we need to wear eye protection when we're working on sites as well. So, here we are again with another hazard uh, to assess. We've got the overhang bank here. And this time it's actually undercut by quite some distance. And when they become undercut, clearly you've got a risk of collapse. But also for a swimmer down here, getting drawn into this area and onto any debris pile, strainer, root system that's down there is potentially quite hazardous. Likewise, for somebody swimming in higher flows here, we've got boulders and other obstructions in the water, all of which you can get caught on or hit at speed and create an injury to your lower back. These features also collect their own debris and you can see here an example of some vegetation getting caught on the upstream or pressure side of this boulder. So this site you may assess as being absolutely capable for you to work in in these conditions today but with a little bit more flow and a little bit more rain everything's got more energy, more volume and is moving much faster and this could become quite a dangerous site. Reflect with your colleagues on common bank and downstream hazards and difficulties of access that you've experienced on work sites with the Environment Agency and how you've counted them when you've arrived on site.
clearly, features like this are temporary in their nature and present a significant hazard with more flow in the river than we have today. Anything that is spanning across the river, that the river is either flowing underneath or through, such as tree and vegetation debris, or a soil pipe or a services pipe, scaffolding, fencing coming in from a bank, there are any number of hazards that either completely span or partially span a flowing watercourse and then will collect their own debris at times of high flow and clearly will collect a swimmer as well. On the training course, when you swim in a life jacket for the first time, we will teach you to swim feet first on your back down the watercourse. That's the best position for you to be able to see what's going on ahead of you and for you to fend off anything with your feet. But effectively what would happen on a site like this is you'd hit it, your legs would probably proceed underneath it and that tree would catch up on the front of your life jacket and pin you there. You would then find that extremely difficult to escape from even in water that you could stand up in. The forces involved and the way that the buoyancy works to prevent you getting your feet down and underneath you are surprising for people if they've never experienced it. So this feature here, with a little bit more water in this river and a little bit of flow going through it, is potentially a hazardous feature. Now, part of your work in the Environment Agency is not only to monitor conditions in the river but also to respond to things like this and potentially remove it. Right? So working around these sorts of things are potentially quite hazardous for you and need to be done at times of very benign flow. You would expect to see lots of this in your watercourses following a high river event or a flood event. And that can be a very dangerous time for the staff to be out and about working. So control measures will need to be adapted based upon what we're expecting to find out there in terms of debris and current flow levels but also, what was it like previous to the day that we visited? So here we are now, wading in the river, shingly bed, Devon, so the streams are nice and clear, and you can usually see and assess the beds quite nicely, not always the case. Ooh. So here we're in sort of like knee-deep water currently, wading with thigh waders on. Just upstream of me is the bridge that we originally uh, looked at the beach, just upstream of that. There's a deep pool there, and we've come to the downstream end of that deep pool now. So my access might be down that set of steps over there, onto this shingle bank, and then into this area here to work or it might be that we're here to deal with that debris over there. Any number of reasons why you're here, but we need to think about where's the best access, where are we working, and what's it like downstream. And on this site here, you can see that we're moving from a nice, deep, stable pool to an area of rougher water, faster water, shallower water, and then it's disappearing off down a bend and dropping away into woodland. So a question we're often asked is how far downstream do I need to assess? And the short answer is, of course, it depends. It depends upon the nature of your site and the hazards and the likelihood of you ending up in the water. But if we were working here, I would want to know what my bank access is like downstream from here to the next deep pool, potentially, or to an area where I kind of go, I'm far enough downstream that if I had a slip, I could definitely get myself to a point of safety and get myself out of the river. And if I can't see, and if there's lots of in-river hazards, such as we have here, and there are bends, and there's gradient, and there's restricted bank access, all of these things are adding to my caution. And, you know, maybe getting to the point where I go, I'm not happy working here in these conditions, either on my own or as a team of two. Pause the video and discuss with your team what actions and assessments you should make of your work site and downstream prior to commencing work to ensure that you have safe access and egress in the case of an emergency. A 
question we're quite often asked on training is what about waders? Are they safe to use or not? And as with everything with water, it's a question of judgment. Um, your waders that you've got may be thigh waders, such as I've got on here, or chest waders that come up to here, typically. Uh, the level of hazard they prevent, present depends entirely upon the nature of the water that you're working in. But they are very common. Some of the criteria that would uh, decide whether or not I would work in a set of waders or go to a full dry suit would be things like flow in the river. The higher the energy of the water in the, wa in, in the uh, river, the more likely I am to go to a dry suit. In other words, waders lend themselves to still or slow moving water. Other factors that might be in there is the depth that I'm going to. Clearly with waders you have the opportunity to overtop. Now, depending on what else you're wearing as part of your personal protective equipment for working in the water, right? if you have an inflatable life jacket on, as soon as you wade to a depth where you get to the bottom of the life jacket, the life jacket is going to deploy. It's got a water activated system fitted to it. So in and of itself, that may be a control measure that limits where you can work with a set of waders on. But if I've got thigh waders on, I will have overtopped the waders before I set my life jacket off. If you look at uh, partner agencies that respond to flooding events, typically the water rescue teams and the fire service flood response teams will now be in full dry suits with a buoyancy aid as opposed to waders and a life jacket. And that's so they have the flexibility to be able to work um, in water that's deeper than hip depth, basically. The other advantage of that is that they'll be more agile in the water and they will be warmer because they're deeper in the water, they've got a thermal protection system on and of course they're protected from the hazmat in the water. You do have dry suits within the Environment Agency and what determines whether you wear a dry suit or a set of waders will be the hazards and the risk assessment and the work protocol. So if you've been issued with a life jacket all right, and you go to a site where there are sharp edges, barbed wire fences or you're using sharp edge tools, you might need to use a different type of personal flotation that's not going to uh, be subject to puncture damage and the hazards associated with that. Likewise, if you go to a flooding event, a set of waders and a life jacket may not be the appropriate uh, equipment for you to be using. You may need to draw from the stores a dry suit and a buoyancy aid and other equipment so that you're protected properly for working in those environments. That said, waders are very common in use. Slow or non-moving water is ideal for waders. As the water speed picks up, if you end up being washed off your feet, even a set of thigh waders will expand and catch water and effectively they'll work like a, uh, a sea anchor and drag you further down the river potentially underneath debris or into a hazard. Other times when I'm going to step away from using waders and go to a dry suit is if my bank access is anything other than like it is here. So if I've got to climb up or down a bank, maybe a ladder or a steep bank or step up and down things or climb back into a boat, once my waders are full of water they're going to be really heavy and restrict my ability either to get back onto my feet in the water course or to get out of the water course onto the bank. So that's a factor that may determine. If I'm working close and around hazards, so even if I'm wading but I'm wading close to uh, a debris pile because I'm trying to attach a winch cable to a tree in the river or something like that, then waders and a life jacket are absolutely not the right system to be using. You would want to be in a dry suit and a robust buoyancy aid and there are options to get buoyancy aids that you can be tethered to prevent you slipping and ending up in the debris pile. Pause the video for a couple of minutes and discuss with your team the PPE that you've been issued with for working around water, what the benefits of your particular PPE is and what the limitations of it are. Are there any jobs or sites that you visit where your PPE may not be the right solution? So on your water training course, we talk about a four stage plan for working safely around water. Stage one is all your preparation. So that's making sure you've got the right training, 
the right equipment, the right number of personnel, you've prepared your site documentation, you've got a full set of RAMs and procedures for what you're doing, and that that's appropriate for the site and the activity and the hazard. In other words, the work is properly planned and not just something that you're doing on the fly. The second stage, which is critical, is that anybody who's got the potential to fall in the water, such as me in this position here, is going to stay on the surface. Now here today, you've got no choice with that because it's very low flow. But on a deeper water course, clearly if I fall in and I don't have any form of personal protective equipment on to keep me afloat, aka a life jacket or buoyancy aid, I'm going to tire potentially relatively quickly and then I'm going to go below the surface. And that will cause all kinds of problems for everybody else on the site because the moral pressure to jump in and save me, even me, will be significant. So, plan the work properly is stage one. Stage two is make sure everybody in your work party, whether they're planning to go in the water or not, has personal protective equipment like a life jacket issued to them. And if they're working coming down to the river's edge or to the watercourse's edge, rather than sitting in a van in the car park, they've got this equipment on. It's properly on, properly adjusted, properly inspected. The third stage then, and this is part of your initial site assessment when you get to site, you come down, you look at the hazards, you identify the risks, and you start to plan where you're going to work. And what everybody in the team needs to understand is where is safe water? And safe water is a relative phase. phase. In other words, where is the least dangerous water? If I could be swimming anywhere in this water course, what would be the best place for me to be? And typically safe water will be on the inside of bends, where you typically have larger eddies. Certainly it's going to be areas where there is slow moving or the water is back filling, okay? not in the main flow. Safe water will also be areas that are away from any entrapment hazards in the river, such as machinery, fencing, debris, stuff like that. It's really important that as a team and as an individual working around the watercourse that you think actively about where these areas of safe water are. Not just at your work site, but downstream, where you're going to get flowed to if you fall in. And then the last element that needs to go into that plan is a discussion and some awareness around where are my options to rescue to and from. And typically they could build on the safe water. So if I've swam into here or come back into this large eddy here, where would I get out? What would I want the people on the bank to do to assist me? You know, pull me up over this debris here or encourage me down to the beach? A statement of the obvious. So the difficulty is, here today, this site is very benign. So absolutely you've got lots of options and very little or low real hazards here. However, come back here on a different day with different flows and suddenly all of this becomes more important. Right, your four stage plan is effectively um, your rescue plan. Make sure you plan your work properly. Make sure people are properly equipped and they've got the PPE on. Okay, identify areas of safety that you want people to swim or move towards if they end up in the river, and then where and how will we get them out? Because your colleague will not be safe until they're back on the bank. People's instinctive reaction is to turn around and either swim back to the thing they've just fallen off, or to swim towards the team members on the bank. And that may or may not be the right thing to do, which is why it's important that you have the discussion and bring it into awareness because effectively what you're doing by identifying areas of safe water and escape points okay, is you are rehearsing a rescue plan. My encouragement to you is that you use your professional skills to do that on each and every work site. Some of us kind of go health and safety is kind of overdone these days and the challenge you'll have with water is that on a day like today, probably nothing of any significance will happen other than a bit of wet clothing and a few giggles. However, people drown every day in the UK and more people drown in the summer than the winter, not because it's more dangerous in the summer, but because more people are recreating 
and moving around watercourses in the summer than they are in the winter. Secondly, people kind of go, I'm okay with this, I've been working in and around water for 15 years. Some of the people who drown in the UK are extremely experienced uh, folk who work around water and certainly can swim. All right? Drowning is a process of physiology, it's got nothing to do with fitness, confidence or experience. Where the experience helps you is making the right judgments, but it can also lead you into a cul-de-sac where you become overconfident and then you cut corners. Pause the video once again and take a few minutes with your team to discuss the four stage plan. Pay particular attention to stage three, identifying safe water when you get to your work site, and stage four, understanding how you would get a swimmer out of the water as these are steps that are easy to miss with an experienced team. So here we are then, very easy bank access, just literally walk in onto a nice stable gravel bed. Good visibility, the water's nice and clean. I nearly always take a wading pole with me, just for stability and so I can check things but I can now move out into the watercourse. As I move into the watercourse, I want to be looking upstream to see if anything's coming at me. That could be a tree, it could be a kayaker. And I also want to look downstream to assess the hazards and where I might be taken to. If you have the option, you will always deploy and work from the inside of a bend, as we've done here. So as we move out, we're moving from shallow, sheltered water into faster flowing water and potentially deeper water. But I'm now in the main stream here and you can see here today with gentle flow I've gone from ankle deep to thigh deep, fairly close to the limit of these waders All right, and I can feel the water pushing against me now. The nature of the riverbed is still the same, it is shingly, small boulders but they are very rounded and very slippery. So the potential to stumble or trip is ever present. What's interesting about this site is if we look where we would go downstream, we'll be taken through the bridge. But as we feed through the bridge, we move into deeper water. And so if I was to get washed off my feet here, even though it's only knee deep, I would be carried into a deeper pool of water and my waders clearly would fill with water and my life jacket would deploy. So the judgment I have to make is how likely am I to end up being washed off my feet? And if I do, and I get carried down there, is there anywhere suitable down there where I can swim out of the main flow of water into a shingle bank and then effectively crawl or walk out the river? If it's steeper banks or it's faster water or there's hazards down there, even though this equipment might be perfectly safe for here, it's not safe for the consequences of a slip and I would need to rethink my plan. Okay, to deploy my throw bag, I found my uh, safe area of water that I want to pull my casualty to. I'm going to hold on to the bag once it's opened, hand into the top, grab the top of the rope, drop it onto the floor. I'm then going to hold on to the bag, grab the remainder of the rope that I've just thrown out, call out to my casualty, swimmer! Okay, onto your back, feet up. Just hold the rope, good. Gently pull them in. The tea gods are safe water. The rescue's not over until their feet are on dry land. Health and safety requires that you have identified all risks and hazards on your work site and that you have developed a safe system of work. A safe system of work includes suitable and sufficient planning for rescue in the event of an accident. Staff are required to be equipped with suitable equipment for the rescue, trained in its use and application, 
and to have regular practice to make sure that they have the skills necessary to perform a rescue or assisted rescue from a point of safety. During the training course we emphasize how dangerous it can be to attempt a rescue. Discuss with your team the correct way of assisting a rescue from water from a position of safety on the bank. Identify equipment that you may take with you such as a reach pole or throw line. It is essential that your team are practiced in the use of a throw line and a reach pole. When a rescue is required, the team need to be efficient and confident in its use. Discuss with your team if they feel they get enough practice to be confident with this equipment. Multi-agency working at flood events. DEFRA lead in the UK on preparing for multi-agency response to wide-scale flooding. You may have heard of a document called the Flood Rescue Concept of Operations, which is a multi-agency planning tool for preparing teams for working together at a flood event based around the emergency services JESSIP model. The purpose of this scheme is to ensure that different teams attending from various agencies have a minimum accredited standard of training so that they can be deployed to work together at a flood event. The shorthand that you'll hear for this is people will refer to DEFRA Mod 1, DEFRA Mod 2, DEFRA Mod 3, DEFRA Mod 4 or DEFRA Mod 5 training. Effectively, your cold water training course will cover you for the requirements to meet DEFRA Mod 1, Annex H, for you to be deployed to assist at the edge of a flood event. If your team requires a higher level of training than this, to actively work within flood water and particularly to assist with rescue response at flood events, then we are able to provide training to the other five levels within the scheme. The question is sometimes asked, why don't we just do the DEFRA Mod 1 Annex H training in its own right with the EA? The short answer is the training content is too limited and too specific to flooding and is not wide enough to cover off the requirements under PURE and the work processes that you use within the EA across a wide variety of water environments. It has been decided that it's better to develop and deliver bespoke training which we have worked with you to develop over the last 10 years. Now, this meets much more accurately your emerging and existing needs across the diverse work environments and workforce. At the same time, the training does cover you for working at flooding in a limited capacity at the level of DEFRA Mod 1 Annex H. As part of our training to the EA, the Cold Water Safety Course, we have produced a very useful water safety field guide. Copies of this are available as a PDF through the EA Water Lead. Alternatively, you can contact us direct and we can send your team hard copies if required. This resource is particularly useful for teams or team members who have not attended a water safety training course in the last three years or so.